thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, it's wonderful to be here. <clears throat> I, I'm going to talk today about not floor homology. And, um, I'd like to apologize for any overlap between this talk and previous talks I've given here. Um, if you've already um, heard much of the material from today, then you can, I'm, I apologize. But I thought it was maybe not be fair to assume that everyone has been to my previous talks. So, okay. So I'll talk about Knopfler homology. And, um, and this is an invariant for knots in the three for knots in a three manifold or in the three sphere. But I'd like, to, I'd like to step back a little bit. This is a colloquium style talk. So I'd like to talk about what is a knot and why do we care before I start into the specifics. So what's a knot? So, f so to, to us today, a knot will be a smoothly embedded circle in the three sphere. And we think about it up to isotopies. So, so we think of it as a sort of closed loop in S3, and it's going to we it's going to we allow it to deform um, in S3, but we don't want to allow. So S3, why say S3? S3 is really R3 with a pointed infinity, and what we don't want to allow, we're never going to allow um, strands to cross each other. We will in a minute, but but when we think about knots, we 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 want to think about knots up to deformation in such a way that strands never actually cross each other. And it's going to be a closed loop in S3. And it's going to be smoothly embedded. OK, so the first question that, so I mean, if you think about it concretely, it's what you have on your shoelace, except you take the two ends of the, of the shoelace and you fuse them together to get a closed loop. And um, so the first question you might wonder is how, how, how to measure the complexity of a knot. So there's a, there's a very um, naive notion of a complexity of a knot, which is called the unknotting number of the knot which is immediately going to say what I told you you're not supposed to do and you're going to do it. So we're going to take this knot, it's sitting in three space, and what we're going to do is we're going to allow ourselves to, um, <coughs> to take strands through each other. So we're going to have a wire clipper. If the knot is made out of metal, we're going to clip it somewhere and then fuse it together again somewhere else. Uh, when we're going to allow the two strands to pass through each other and we'll fuse them back together. So this is, this is some operation which passes one strand through the other. And um, the final game that we would like to end up with, we want to end up with a closed loop that's unknotted. That's called the unknot. So um, the uh, very nice, naive notion of complexity of a knot is the following. If I start with a knot, I want to find the minimal number of moves of this type that'll take my knot and bring it to the unknot. Now, um, one could interpret this question naively. You take some, OK, so how do we represent a knot? So the way we draw a knot is we draw what's called the knot projection, which is a generic knot projection is going to be some picture of a knot where um, <coughs> two strands are projected down to the same point. Um, but we don't want to allow, for example, three knots. Three, three strands to project to this same point because that's not a generic situation. We want, we'll allow double points. And then we're going to remember which, which is above and which is below. So this is, this is a combinatorial way of representing a knot. And if I draw some picture of a knot, you might think of the unknotting number of that picture to be the um, minimum number of of um, <coughs> crossings there that you need to change it to get to the unknot, but I don't want to restrict myself in that way. So I think of my knot as living somewhere in three-dimensional space, and we're going to allow, we're going to define the unknotting number of k to be the minimum number of crossing changes. So I start with k, which is my first knot, k1, and then I change it to k2, to k3, kn. So for example, 
the knot that I drew it at the beginning of the day here is called the trefoil. It's the simplest unknot. It's the simplest knot that is actually a knot, the unknot. If I perform this crossing change on it, then I end up with a knot which I can just untwist this and pull it back here to get the unknot. So the trefoil, you have to first check that it's not actually secretly the unknot, but once you know that, we know that the unknotting number of the trefoil is one. Okay, so this is a nice measure of complexity of a knot. If the unknotting number of k is zero, that's true if and only if k is the unknot. So it's a nice numerical invariant of knots. But it has a drawback, which is that it's very hard to compute. So, in fact, there's no algorithm for, compu for computing the unknotting number of a knot. Um, and there are kind of amazingly very simple con conjectures about the unknotting number that are not known. So, for instance, um, if you have two knots, you we don't know an algorithm, that's right. Um, so there's a simple operation that given two knots produces for us a third knot, which is called the connected sum. You just do this locally. Um, or if you think about it as a knot as being some recipe that you tie on your shoelace, you, you first do K1 and then you do K2. So um, there's a conjecture that the unknotting number of this connected sum of, two knot, of any two knots is equal to the unknotting number of K1 plus the unknotting number of K2. So it's amazing that this is an open conjecture. So it's easy to see an inequality. So it's easy to see that, that if I can unknot K1 in N steps and I unknot K2 in M steps, then I can unknot this in the, in the sum of K1 plus N1, N plus M steps. But, but the conjecture says that somehow this, this doesn't give you some additional tricks. So you might think that maybe the connected sum, you could have some additional tricks to move around with that region, but this is not known. So this remains a conjecture. Well, there's, there's, there's good computational, I mean, sort of, um, is there any reason to believe that it's true? So there, there's, there's good, uh, uh, it's true in every case that we know to compute. I don't know if that's good enough reason. Um, there, <clears throat> there, there's now, I mean, they now know that there are sort of ridiculous bounds, but it's a theorem from the 70s of Charle Charlemagne that if the unknotting number of, uh, that the, if, if K1 and K2 are non-trivial, then the unknotting number of K1 plus K2 is bigger than 1. Say again? So you have a drawing of some, some close curve in the plane, and now you choose just some, some bridges going up and down, right? Uh-huh. No, 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 no. There's an, always an algorithm. You can, you can get, if you give me a, a drawing of the unknot, then there's an algorithm for unknotting the knot, but we don't know if that's minimal. So you, if, you, if you give me a drawing in the plane, then there's an algorithm, then, then by changing the crossing sufficiently, you can get an unknot always. So you can always do the naive algorithm. You can, there's always a naive algorithm, so you can get a bound on the unknotting number. But, um, but, 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 but you would imagine that one could do better. But there's finitely many. Pardon? There are finitely many knots with a given unknotting number. No, no, there are not finitely many knots with a given unknotting number. You can have a very complicated knot. So here, uh, <coughs> if I take any knot at all, I seem to be drawing the same knot always. <laughs> then we can do what's called the whitehead double, which is to draw the knot twice and put a little clasp here. These knots always have a knotting number one because you can just pull that apart and then okay. suck it down. Okay. But the, 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 the unknotting number can depend on the drawing that you take. So it, it no, no, the unknotting number of a knot doesn't depend on the drawing. The unknotting number is an. So yeah. if I give you a drawing, you might need more, you might need more steps than there's another drawing. That's right. That's right. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so the connected sum. No, you don't. So, so, so in order to form the connected sum, you have to orient the two knots 
and you have to um, so <clears throat> and you have to do the connect sum this way. So so th there's some ambiguity. The connect, but but then once you've done this, it doesn't matter how you do it. So th there, there's there there are so. Um, the connected sum is naturally an operation on oriented knots. Um, and, um, but once you chose the orientation, it's, it's well defined. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ah, that, that's right. I, I, of course, should have said that that's sort of the first question. Um, um, I know of no algorithm. Um, but is it telling. Or I, I don't know. I, I'm, 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 I, I, it's, it's. Yeah, so th there's, th so, so if you can, if you can, ah, okay, yeah, how can I, okay. So you are saying if I draw my knots with different diagrams and I do the connected sum, I will get always the same thing? That's right. The, the, the connected sum doesn't depend on a diagram. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, <sighs> okay, good. Excellent. So, um, all right. So, let me des describe some other invariant if we don't like the unknotting number. And that's called the cipher genus. Is there a question? There's a discussion. There's a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so there's, another, there's another measure of complexity which is, which is much more tractable, which is called the cipher genus of a knot. And, um, and the, the basic point is that any knot can be realized as, <clears throat> if K is a knot, then I can find some smoothly embedded surface in S3 whose boundary is K. So for example, here's another drawing of the trefoil. And if I take this surface, I should say an orientable surface, or oriented surface. If, if I take this two disks connected by three strips, then this is a surface, a smoothly embedded surface in S3, whose boundary is the given knot. And it's orientable, so that, that, that's, that's important to notice. Um, so, um, it's got a top and a bottom. And one can, <coughs> so abstractly, an orientable surface is just a connected sum of G tori with a disk removed. So it has a genus. Um, in this case, the genus is one. We can look at the genus of a knot to be the minimum genus of a surface uh, such that <coughs> boundary of F is K. And again, this is a nice invariant in the sense that the genus of a knot is zero if and only if k is the unknot. And now there's no conjecture like that. It's a theorem that the cipher genus of the connected sum of two knots is the cipher genus of k1 plus the cipher genus of k2. Um, you can find this in chapter one of Licorice's book on knot theory. It's, an, it's a, um, not a difficult theorem. Um, <clears throat> but again, this is, um, and there are algorithms for computing the cipher genus. Um, but um, but it's not easy to compute. So 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 it's it's hard to just stare at a picture and and see what the answer is. Um, <clears throat> okay, I want to talk about a fourth um, <clears throat> not invariant. Um, yeah, right. There are three kinds of mathematicians: those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. What was the question? No, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there will be a fourth. Uh, but before I do that, there's still going to be a third. So the, there's the slice genus of a knot. And the slice genus of a knot is defined as follows. So this is maybe a little further away 
from the <coughs> so this is still this, this is still kind of reasonable. Um, you can so so the unknotting number is very easy to define. The unknotting number is a, is, a, is a number essentially you can kind of explain to a child. Here you have to talk about the classification of surfaces. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's not that much that horrible. Uh, no, there's no relationship between U and G. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, right. So, right. Um, but uh, but I'm going to talk about another invariant that does bring things together, and this is the four-ball genus. Pardon? Say again. No, there aren't. These are all genus one. So. <coughs> Um, the, 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 the other invariant I'd like to talk about is the following. So we can think of the three-sphere as living on the boundary of the four-ball. And we can think of our knot as living on the boundary of the three-sphere. And we can ask for what's the minimal genus of an embedded surface in the four-ball with boundary the given knot. So, um, so we, 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 the slice genus of K is the minimum uh, genus of surface, so, so F is embedded in now the four ball, so that the boundary of F is equal to um, K, living in S3, which is um, the boundary of the four ball. So, so that is to say, we allow ourselves to kind of push into the four into four dimensional space, and um, so what's obvious is that the slice genus is less than or equal to the the cipher genus, because if you have the surface in, in, in S3, you can just push it nicely, just a little bit into the four ball. And um, what's the other thing that's, that's true is that the, um, no, it's this way around. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the other one is that, that um, that the um, great. So, so for, let me let me give you some examples. So, um, <clears throat> so if you take any knot, well, let's not take, take any knot. Let's take these two knots. So, I'm going to take the trefoil and I'm going to take its mirror and I'm going to connect some of them. Then it's an entertaining and not very difficult visualization exercise to find a disk in the four, in four space with boundary that knot. So this, this, has, this is a knot whose slice genus is, is zero. And in fact, this is true for any knot. If we take any knot and you reflect it and connect some with itself, you always get something that, that bounds a slice disk. So if you're having a hard time visualizing it, start like this um, and keep doing it. Um. <coughs> okay, so uh, another relationship with the unknotting number is that if you have an unknotting, if you have an unknotting of a knot, that gives rise to a surface in four space. How? Well, just, just imagine your knot is traveling through space in a movie. And every time it crosses itself, uh, there's a singularity. So that's actually it gives you an immersed disk in the four in four dimensional space. But if you don't like immersed disks, you can resolve the singularity. And, and um, so that is to say, <coughs> instead of allowing the two strands to cross through each other, you form a connect self connected sum. It's the same thing that you imagine, like um, w times z equals zero in C two. You could set it instead equal to epsilon and get an annulus. So in this way, an unknotting operation on a knot also gives you a surface in four space. And what, that, what you conclude from that is that the slice genus is less than or equal to the unknotting number. OK, so these are, there are, again, no algorithms for computing the slice genus of a, of a knot. Um, so this is an, and actually the slice genus is the first place where, where interesting four-dimensional topology comes into play because I didn't really say what I meant by a surface embedded in four space. So, okay, um, well, we're, we're all 
friends, right? A surface embedded in fourth space. A smooth surface in, the, in, in B4, um, which is smoothly embedded. But, um, but <clears throat> then there are people for whom that's not a good definition, and they want a topological embedding. So that we have a topological embedding of the surface in the four-dimensional space, which means that there are local neighborhoods around that surface that are homeomorphic to R2 sitting in R4. So there's a sort of uh, topological notion instead of a smooth notion of embedded surface, and that gives one a different notion of slice genus. So, so, the, so smooth four-dimensional topology is hiding in this definition, is my point. Okay. Pardon? Um, well, in, when we define this, when we define the, um, <clears throat> there are, but when we define the slice uh, genus, we want to think about the standard four ball. But yeah, one can, one can play around with this even further. Okay, so, so these, are, these are examples of nice numerical not invariants. Maybe I haven't convinced you about how nice they are. They're, they're natural um, and, and they're hard to understand. So let me give you now instead a not invariant that's not hard to understand <coughs> and can be cal computed in a fairly straightforward way. That's called the Alexander polynomial of a knot. And I'm going to give Conway's very elegant characterization of it. So the Alexander polynomial of a knot is the unique invariant of knots that satisfies the following properties. It's an, it's an invariant. Um, which is a Laurent polynomial in, in a formal variable T. And it satisfies the normalization condition that for the unknot, we get the constant one function. And the second is called the skein relation. And, um, and it looks like this. The Alexander polynomial of a knot with a, with a given crossing that looks locally like this minus the Alexander polynomial of the knot where that crossing has been changed is equal to t to the one half minus t to the minus one half times the Alexander polynomial of the knot, and this is a lie, where that crossing has been resolved. And I said it was a lie. Where was it a lie? Well, you're supposed to observe that if this is really a knot projection, it's got a crossing in it, the moment I resolve it, I get two component, a two component link. So we have to generalize from the, our world from knots to links. And, we, and instead of having knots, we're going to have an oriented link. A link with an orientation on it. And then the Laurent polynomial will be in square root of t. And it's a fact that for knots, it turns out to be a Laurent polynomial and just in t. Yeah? OK? So this is polynomial in t, polynomial in t. Okay, so this is the Alexander polynomial, isn't it? So for the unlink, it's also one. For, for the unlink, it's zero. So so by the so if you if you so so if I if I take this knot this unknot his invariant is one and I subtract off the knot that I get by changing this crossing, then um, then then I get the the something times the the invariant for the unlink. But that's, um, this is 1 minus 1. So the, the invariant for the unlink is 0. OK, so, so this is a, a nice invariant. You can compute it explicitly for knots. Um, it's not hard. It has some drawbacks. One is that it doesn't actually distinguish knots. So for instance, um, <coughs> if we take, um, if we're tired of drawing the trefoil over and over again, here's the. 12 crossing Kinoshi to Terasaka knot is 11 crossing knot. I've drawn a 12 crossing projection, but if you can eliminate one of the crossings by um, playing around with it, this is a, poly this is a knot whose, whose Alexander polynomial is identically one. So this is one of the shortcomings of the, um, of the Alexander polynomial. Um, OK. So um, on the other hand, it is related to the other knot invariants. For instance, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry it's, it's related to the, it behaves nicely in various ways. For instance, 
the <coughs> Alexander polynomial of a connect sum of two knots is the Alexander polynomial of K1 times the Alexander polynomial of K2. And there's a nice relationship with, with the Seifert genus, which is that, um, well, I, should, I should mention, the Alexander polynomial is a symmetric polynomial in T. So, and I should do another non-trivial example. The Alexander polynomial of the trefoil knot is T minus one plus T inverse. What's that? Could you, could you elaborate on this? On this equation? On this equation? Yes. It's, some, it's just that, that I got some raw polynomial in T, which is the same when I oh, stick in. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I need K, a naught for that. Otherwise, there's a sign. OK. So um, excellent. Um, <coughs> Where are we? Um, right. So, um, oh, well, right. What I wanted to say was the following. So, so the Alexander polynomial has the following form for a knot. It looks like t to the sum d plus da 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 da, da plus t to the minus d. So these are smaller coefficients in so no, sorry a sub d, a sub d, and um, and and <coughs> AD in absolute value is not zero. AD is not zero. So, so, so there's some degree of the Alexander polynomial. So it's a symmetric polynomial in T, and we're going to just look at the topmost non-zero coefficient in T, and we're going to call that the degree of the Alexander polynomial. So the degree of the Alexander polynomial of a non gives you a lower bound on the Seifert genus of K. So that's the relationship between the Alexander polynomial and at least one of the earlier invariants that we studied. And you see this inequality is not sharp um, because here we've got an Alexander polynomial of degree zero, but the knot is a non-trivial knot. Okay, so, so these are classical knot invariants. And um, are there any questions about them? This is G, not, not G S of K, this is G K, that's correct, yes. It's not true for G S of K. Um, it's n um, not true for G S of K, that's right. Uh, we, which is difficult to compute? G, sorry, this is not, this is not difficult to compute. The Alexander polynomial is not difficult to compute. Yeah, like... What's that? Okay, so uh, maybe I didn't write down nicely, but from this you can write down. A, there's a, there's a there's some nice formulas for this um, that are local, um, which I'll t come back to. This is what's called the state sum formula. You can draw this by looking at a, at a at a at a projection. Yeah, a priori it looks like you need to choose an unknotting sequence, but but in fact it's not so hard to compute. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. So I'd like to talk about a different kind of knot invariant, and um, and that is knot floor homology. And knot floor homology <coughs> is an invariant for knots. Which, um, which was defined um, around um, in 2003 in joint work with, with Zoltan Subel and independently discovered by Jake Rasmussen. And it comes in the heel of, so this was defined after, uh, by modifying a construction called Hagard Fleur homology. which is really a closed three-manifold invariant. But I'm, I'm not going to, this was defined around 2000 um, by me and Zoltan. And 
I probably won't say anything else about it. Um, so, um, but let me say a few words about this, this construction. The, 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 <coughs> the construction was motivated by, by some constructions in symplectic geometry, and um, specifically Lagrangian fleur homology. And it's defined by counting certain pseudo-holomorphic curves. So, um, but by now, we have several um, alternative combinatorial formulations of it. So what I'd like to do is, is, rather than giving the definition right now, I would like to say properties of this invariant and how it's related to the previous constructions. And then, probably in my second lecture, I'm going to start to give uh, construction. Okay? So, <clears throat> so, Hagar, so not floor homology. What is not floor homology? Not floor homology is, there, there are two versions of it. Let me just talk about first the simplest version, um, <coughs> which we call HFK hat. This is <coughs> a bigraded abelian group. So, so if you look at homology theory, it's a, um, it's a, it's a graded abelian group. Um, it's a, to given a topological space, one has these groups that are indexed by, by, integer, by integers d, and non-negative integers d. Um, by contrast, uh, non-floor homology is indexed by two integers, so um, d and s. So, <coughs> and now these are integers, so they can be negative. So, <coughs> if you like, <coughs> we can just consider the the plane, and over each lattice point in the in the plane, we put a vector space. And in fact, this is a finite dimensional vector space. So what that means is that after a while you run out of gas and you put zero-dimensional vector spaces over most points. So this is some, some <coughs> ve vector space. So I want to work, um, there, there are various levels of generality, I want to use the simplest version. So there's a vector space over Z mod 2. Okay? So there's a vector space over Z mod 2 and it's got two gratings on it. So <coughs> How is it related to the previous non invariants? Well, in classical homology theory, you can take the Euler characteristic of the homology to get the Euler characteristic of the space. That's if you have one dimension. Here we have two dimensions. So we can look at this. Um, oh, maybe before I do that, let me just give you some examples. The, for the unknot, the vector space looks like this. I have a single one dimension. I'm going to f is z mod 2. I'm going to have a single copy of z mod 2 right at the origin, and everywhere else I get 0. So this is what the not floor homology of the unknot looks like. For the trefoil, it looks like three copies of f on a diagonal line. So this is at um, you know, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Minus one, minus two. This is the not floor homology of the right handed trefoil. <coughs> um, <coughs> HFK hat of the um, I won't draw it again. The Kinoshita Terasaka knot that I drew earlier looks like this. Um, seven, six, four, four, one, one, four, four, one, one. It lives on two diagonal lines. These numbers are just the dimensions of the vector space. And everywhere else, it's zero. OK? So these are some examples of floor homology. Some things that cannot be aligned? Yeah. There are, there are all sorts of uh, constraints on these, uh, these groups. Um, le but uh, um, let me not go into that just now. Um, we don't know which bigraded vector spaces are not floor homology groups of knots. So, so, so I, 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 we don't know the full answer to the, to the question you were going to ask in a moment. But there are certain symmetries that these groups 
that these vector spaces do satisfy. OK, so. Uh, yeah, so for example, for the Alexander polynomial, if you give me any polynomial that's symmetric in T, there's a knot who's got that as its Alexander polynomial. And there are knots of arbitrary gene, gene genera and, and Okay, great. So, um, so, 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 I wanted to say that there's some relationship between this and the other invariants, and that is that if I've got this 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 bigraded abelian group, I can take what's called this graded Euler characteristic, which means that I take the Euler characteristic in each vertical line, and I get a a long polynomial in T by recording the horizontal variable as an exponent of T. So, if explicitly, I'd say the Euler characteristic of knot floor homology by definition is a Laurent polynomial in T, which is defined to be um, minus 1 to the D times the dimension of the knot floor homology group, DKS times T to the S. So this is a Laurent polynomial in T. And um, this is a knot invariant. In fact, it turns out that it's equal to the Alexander polynomial. So this, this invariant is um, in the language of Hovanov, this is what we would call a categorification of the Alexander polynomial. The um, Alexander polynomial is a polynomial invariant of knots, which is, in, in this sense, the Euler characteristic of this bigraded abelian group. Okay, so there's a symmetry which it looks like this, that the floor homology of, of DK S is isomorphic to the floor homology uh, K minus S, D minus 2S. So there's a symmetry that when you flip the T direction but also pushes in the, in the vertical direction, which is, which you can check for these pictures. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so And um, it's related to the um, Seifert genus. Remember, there was a formula that said that the, that the degree of the Alexander polynomial <coughs> um, gives a lower bound on the Seifert genus of K. There's a corresponding inequality, but that's sharp for knot floor homology. In fact, there's a the following theorem from um, from 2003, which says that the cipher genus of a knot is precisely equal to the maximum S, such that the floor homology in this floor homology group is not zero. That is to say, we have this blob of points in the plane where the floor homology is non-trivial, then kind of half the breadth is, the, is equal to the cipher genus of the knot. So for example, our Kinoshita Terasaka knot is a knot whose cipher genus is equal to 2. And what you see is this distance of 2 here. And you see this kind of horrible um, plot in the Euler characteristic, right? We've got two, two, two one-dimensional vector spaces in consecutive d degrees. So in the Euler characteristic, they drop out. So you take the Euler characteristic of this this graded Euler characteristic of this vector space, you end up with just the constant one function. But what we have here are these, these two generators that compute the cipher genus of the knot. So the corollary, the dimension of knot floor homology is one if and only if k is the unknot. So the Yes, this was not the first gene, this is not the first algorithm. The first algorithms were, were by Haken, but yes, it, it, it can be it can be algorithmically computed. Except you didn't tell us yet how to calculate the No, I, I didn't tell you, and I'm not going to today. I'm, how to calculate the definition? Uh, yeah, I, not, I didn't tell you the definition. I, I you know, it all depends on on uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I want you to want to hear the definition first. OK, so. Um, <coughs> so, so do the other two nodes which are the same? 
<laughs> yes, there are. So this is not a, it's not a perfect invariant. Um, <coughs> yeah, there are knots that have the same knot floor homology groups. Um, let, me give you, let me give you another application. Um, <coughs> but in order to give you that application, I'd like to, um, to talk about a, a slightly um, fancier variant of knot floor homology. And that is um, maybe unfortunate notation, but we call it HFK minus. It's a, it's, a, it's a version of knot floor homology, which is a module over a polynomial algebra in a formal variable u. And again, f is my two-dimensional, is my z mod two. So, <coughs> What does that mean? Uh, there's, a, there's a version of Knopfler homology that also has an endomorphism by some operator u. And, and this operator u drops, okay, so I, I need some names. <coughs> this is called the Maslov grading. And this is called the Alexander grading. And, and U drops Maslov grading by 2. And it drops Alexander grading by 1. So, um, <clears throat> so that is to say that for HFK minus, I drew these nice examples of HFK hat. HFK minus is no longer a finite dimensional vector space, but it's a finitely generated module over f of u. So for the unknot, I just have an a sort of chain of f's which are connected by this um, u operator. So hfk minus of the unknot is isomorphic to just f of u. It's a free module of rank 1. For the trefoil, um, the module structure looks like HFK minus of the trefoil is one copy of F and another copy of F of U. And what I mean is that there's a generator which is in the kernel of U. Uh, as, an, as an element, which when I hit it with U, I get zero. And, and then there's an, a free sum n. Okay, so this is, this is some more algebraic structure than, um, than HFK hat. And you might wonder, what's the purpose of that algebraic structure? And the purpose of that algebraic structure is to relate it to the four-ball genus, the slice genus. So, <clears throat> so let me just say a few words. HFK minus is a finitely generated module over a polynomial algebra in a single generator u. In some sense, if you set u equal to 0, you get that HFK hat that I talked about earlier. And um, one can now define, and it has the following structure, that HFK minus well, let me just say it this way. That one can define tau of a knot to be the maximum S such that HFK minus KS times U to the N is not zero for all M. Okay, that, that maybe didn't look so nice. But what I mean is the following. So F of, the HFK minus has the following algebraic structure. It's isomorphic to a single copy of f of u. And then it's got a bunch of other sum ends that look like f of u modulo u to the n's. Various torsion sum ends. And what I want to do is I want to take the non-torsion element, and I want to look at a non-torsion element with maximal Alexander grading. That's what this quantity is. So I look at the maximum Alexander grading of a U non-torsion element, and I multiply by minus 1 to be consistent with everything else. And we define that to be K. Uh, sorry, tau. So this is a, a numerical invariant of knots. 
And you might wonder why on earth one would be interested in this. So let me, let me say something. This is another theorem. Um, <coughs> now I'll make up a number. It's around 2004, I guess, which was that the, the slice genus of an, that the absolute value of tau gives a lower bound on the slice genus of k. So, so this is a, this this numerical invariant of knots gives gives a lower bound on, on the slice genus of a knot. And um, maybe to give to put this into context. Um, there was a <coughs> um, question about the slice genus of knots that was um, very successfully answered by Kronheimer and Rufka in the early 90s, which is the following. Um, Milner conjectured in the 70s that if one takes the PQ torus knot, what's the PQ torus knot? You take P vertical strands and you introduce into it Q twists. So this is the 3, 4 torus knot, I think. <coughs> so Milner, so, so, so P strands and Q kind of 1 over P twists. Milner conjectured that the unknotting number of the PQ torus knot is P minus 1 times Q minus 1 over 2. And um, <coughs> in fact, Okay, so, so it, it's in a theorem So this contention is it's the most complicated it could be. Yeah, I guess you could say it that way. Um, <coughs> so there's a, there's a theorem from 1991 of Kronheimer and Rufka. which affirmed that. So they proved this con conjecture. And, um, and uh, their proof used gauge theory. And um, so, the <coughs> so there's an alternative proof. In around 2003, Rasmussen gave a, gave a combinatorial proof using Hovanov homology. Which was... Uh, kind of a remarkable breakthrough because um, uh, uh, um, uh, I can explain how a little later, but the point is that, that, that it was thought that this is a, a fundamentally four-dimensional theorem. Once you know this theorem is true, it's not hard to prove that, that there are sm fake smooth structures on R4. So this is thought of as a, as a deep theorem. And, and yet, sort of Hovano homology, which is a purely combinatorial definition, was able to prove this. And sort of in... So, so just give a uh, alternative proof of uh, uh, different uh, smooth structure of R4. Yeah, not that's right. That's right, that's right. So in 2011, Sharkar... Well, the only question is the lower bound. Hmm? Yeah. Well, the question is yeah. the lower bound. Yeah, that's right. Sure. That's right. 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 So in 2011, Sharkar gave a combinatorial proof So I, I guess this theorem, so, so okay, so it's easy to Once you know this theorem, it's easy, it's a computation One computes that the tau invariant of the PQ torus knot is exactly what you wanted it to be So we um, but in, 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 in 2011, Sharkar gave a completely combinatorial proof of this using knot flow homology. So, um, okay, so at some point maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that proof. But the point is that, 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 that this knot flow homology enc encodes in it this interesting lower bound on the slice genus of a knot. For seven years, no one noticed that this theorem. No, I don't mean that. Sorry, does it appear that way? No, no, uh, Kronheim Rufka proved this in... Yeah, but you said that... Oh, you mean... The, so, well, okay, so... 
Knopfler homology had a combinatorial formulation in 2006. So, so it's not seven years, it's five years. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, I'm just trying to find, um, oh, okay, good. I'm not really using my cell phone during the talk. I'm just trying to find out what time it is. Okay, um, great. Um, all right, so, so are there any other questions? Um, <coughs> I guess in my remaining eight minutes, I could talk about some other applications of knot floor homology. Um, maybe I'll do that. So, um, what's that? Say again? What's the connection with the Jones polynomial? That's a that's a deep and unknown question. So, Khovanov homology is is connected to the Jones polynomial because the Euler characteristic of Khovanov homology is the Jones polynomial. Um, so then the question becomes, what's the relationship between Hovanov homology and, and Knopfler homology? And that's still not known. Um, so, there pardon? There there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a conjecture about, there's a rank inequality, there's a conjecture that the total dimension of Hovanov homology um, is um, bigger than or equal to the, um, the total dimension of Knopfler homology. So th there's a what, one way that could happen is if there's a spectral sequence from Hovanov homology to not floor homology. Pardon? It's also not complete. It's also not complete. Um, in 2010, Kronheimer and Murfka proved that it detects the unknot as well. Um, so when, when you say combinatorial formulation, you mean that there is a procedure to compute? Yes. But also, there is a combinatorial proof that everything well yes, yes. There's a combination of proof that everything is well defined. Um, so, <laughs> good. So, that, yeah? The yes, non flow homology detects the unknown. That's right. There's no combinatorial proof of that. But there's a, there's a combinatorial proof that non flow homology um, is well defined, but right now we don't know a proof that it detects the unknown. We, Based on the fact that the <laughs> No, no, it's based on, so not floor homology, the original construction of not floor homology uses, uses the theory of pseudo-holomorphic disks, and using that definition and some four-dimensional properties, one can prove that not floor homology detects the unknot. But, um, but one also has an explicit combinatorial construction of not floor homology, which I'm going to give in my next lecture. And um, from that, one can also prove that it's a knot invariant. But right now, we don't know a proof that that it detects the unknot that doesn't go through kind of large amounts of mathematics. So there's no. So there's no combinatorial proof of this theorem. There's a combinatorial proof of this theorem, but there's no combinatorial theorem of proof of that theorem. Okay. So. Um, uh, <coughs> okay. So five minutes. I, I'll, I'll say maybe two other um, applications. Um, <laughs> because they're more recent. Um, oh, one. I'll give one. So, so one, one can ask the following question. Um, <clears throat> I define the slice genus of a knot to be the minimum genus of, an, of a smoothly embedded surface sitting in the four ball that bounds the knot. But one can also define it, that's what might call, if, if one wanted to be very precise, that would be the differentiable slice genus. And there's also what you might call the, the topological slice genus, or maybe the smooth slice genus, where one only asks for surfaces that are locally homeomorphic to R2s in, in R4. And <coughs> it's a remarkable fact that these two quantities are different. This is sort of the heart of smooth four-dimensional topology. Um, the, 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 uh, I mean, it's not always strict, but, but there are examples where the topological slice genus is smaller than the smooth slice genus. And as I alluded, examples where the topological slice genus are zero, but the smooth slice genus is not, immediately give rise to, to, to exotic structures on R4. But, um, so there are examples of knots. Maybe I'll give you the simplest example. The simplest example of a knot 
is the trefoil. White had doubled. We white had doubled the trefoil. And then we put in the right number of twists to get its Alexander polynomial equal to 1. That is a knot, so I, 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 I didn't draw it, but you have to draw three twists, and I might put them the wrong way. It's either this way or the opposite of this way. Um, <clears throat> and that's a knot whose, um, whose, that's topologically sliced by a deep theorem of Friedman. And you can compute its tau invariant and gig out one. So this is an example of a knot that is topologically sliced, but not smoothly sliced. Um, and one might ask, are how many knots are like that? And there's a theorem There's a beautiful theorem of Jen Hom from 2012, which says there are many knots like that. But so let me phrase it as follows. So um, <coughs> there's a nice way of, of organizing knots as follows. One can look at the, what's called the concordance group of knots. That is to say, we're going to take knots. And we're going to say that K1 is equivalent to K2 if the connected sum of K1 with the mirror of K2 is slice. And one can, it's a, it's a fact that connected sum gives this, this is a group. So if I look at all knots modulo this equivalence relation, that forms a group. And the group operation is connected sum. And um, like I said, there are two different versions of this equivalence relation. There's the smooth, and there's the topological. And the theorem is the following. So one can look at the, there's a, there's a forgetful map from the, for the, from the smooth to the topological. And that has a kernel. The kernel is those knots that are topologically sliced. And the theorem of Hom is that there exists an infinite Z connect sum and inside of, um, inside of the kernel of this. So there's a kernel so how should, I, how should I write this nicely? The, the, the statement is that, that the kernel, that kernel has the form of an infinite direct sum of z's um, plus something else. That's not a nice statement, sorry. So, so there, there exists a z to the infinity sitting inside of here, which is a direct sum n. And um, the proof of this um, uses a, a modified version of knot flow homology. So I'm, I'm actually, um, if I get a chance to, I can, I can, I can sketch a proof of this um, in my fourth lecture, maybe. But, OK, so um, all right, so these were, these were some of the results I wanted to say. Um, there are other theorems about knot flow homology, but I'm, I'm not going to list any more. And next time, I'm going to give a, give a, a an explicit description of knot floor homology, and I'm going to sketch um, its invariance proof. And in my third lecture, I'm going to give another um, more recently discovered description of knot floor homology. Okay, so maybe I should stop now.